Good evening. A very warm welcome to Lancaster Priory. Um, my name is Leah, and you won't have seen me before because I'm the new vicar, and I've only been here for about six weeks. So it is my privilege to welcome you to the Priory Church. And there are a couple of things I'd just like to tell you about before we get started. We are, as you will see, if you look around you, at, in the middle of hosting a rather spectacular exhibition by Jackie Parkinson called Threads Through Creation. Um, and it is really beautiful. And the panels are positioned all the way around the Priory. Um, there, are, there are several more further to the back. And please do take the time to explore that either this evening um, after the lecture when you have a drink or come back before the 3rd of November and, and have a look at it. Then, of course, if you're local, you'll know all about Light Up Lancaster, a treat that I'm going to experience for the first time. Um, but we are preparing for a rather spectacular second exhibition for those two days to come in to the Priory. So again, please visit us then. And then finally, this beautiful piece of artwork which is hanging from the pulpit at the moment is a foretaste of the project called Murmurations, um, which is working with an artist to do prints um, uh, inspired um, by uh, the RSPB and also in, in, by a way of making a collective memory of our experiences throughout COVID. So there's also an audio murmuration being prepared. So there'll be an audio murmuration and a visible murmuration that will form part of our archive of our experience of traveling together through COVID-19. So again, watch out for more about murmurations coming in throughout November and early December. So we have gathered for the fifth annual Lancaster Priory Lecture, which is in partnership with the Department for English Literature at the University of Lancaster. Uh, it's a really wonderful occasion to gather together to think around the area of literature and religion. And I'm going to introduce you now to Dr. Andy Tate, who will introduce Rachel Mann to us and the lecture this evening. Good evening. It's lovely to be here, and uh, we're very grateful to the Priory for uh, working with us and inviting us and hosting us here. It's my great honour to introduce Rachel this evening. Rachel resists easy definition. She's an Anglican priest who serves as area dean for Bury and Rossendale and as honorary canon of Manchester Cathedral. She's a theologian, poet, a novelist, sometimes at the same time. A writer of powerful memoir, and a scholar whose work engages vividly with the work of other writers. The titles of Rachel's many books, A Kingdom of Love, Dazzling Darkness, Fierce Imaginings, and Love's Mysteries, testify to her love of language and fascination with human complexity. The recurring themes of her work in its many forms include memory, grief, loss, and embodiment. These fundamental matters, issues of ultimate concern, are frequently framed with open and honest reference to faith. Rachel dares to ask big questions, and her work also suggests that mystery and forms of spiritual hope are not strangers, but rather intimately linked. She's written about the Great War and Lent courses inspired by The Greatest Showman and Rocket Man. This is a return to Lancaster for Rachel, to the city where she studied philosophy to postgraduate level. We were, in fact, contemporaries, and I remember Rachel as a brilliant actor and musician in many student productions. Good manners prevent me from mentioning in which decade, or indeed in which century, that was. Rachel later turned to the study of 19th century literature, completing a doctorate on women writers and biblical narrative. Her work in this field includes an edition of Christina Rossetti's poetry and in the bleak midwinter, a compelling set of meditations inspired by the writer. I heart heartily recommend that book. 
Rachel's first volume of poetry, published by Carcanet in 2019, honors Rossetti's legacy in exploring pain, belonging, and the possibility and impossibility of love. Rachel's debut novel, The Gospel of Eve, published in October 2020, has been described by Rowan Williams as vividly compelling, and by the Reverend Kate Botley as good old-fashioned, slightly mischievous fun. High praise indeed. Her new book, with her intriguingly gothic title, Spectres of God, is published at the end of November 2021, just in time for the lucrative Christmas market. Rachel is, in short, very busy, but her work also bears witness to her capacity for attentiveness, for looking again and more carefully at the world, for finding grace and beauty in unexpected places and people. It's rare that we're able to welcome a writer whose books encompass Christina Rossetti, Incarnation and National Theology, Hugh Jackman, and Elton John, but tonight we've been gifted with that very speaker, whose title is The Flesh That Needs to Be Love. Dramatic pause. The power and beauty of bodies in a time of pandemic. Friends, colleagues, please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Rachel Mann. Thank you so much. Am I on? Thank you. Can you hear me? Um, it's always good to get applause at the start because I never think you're guaranteed to get applause at the end. Um, so I will take applause where I can find it. Thank you, Andy, for that just extraordinarily generous introduction. And as I was driving up to tonight, I was thinking, oh, Lancaster weather, Lancaster weather, there's nothing like it. I, I don't mind saying I'm really anxious about what I'm going to say tonight. Um, partly because I'm not sure it counts as a lecture, it's more a series of meditations. And, and I think it might be an essay in my own intellectual decline, uh, an invitation into my emergent dottiness. Um, I think I'm going to say some things which in places will make me feel quite vulnerable. I like to feel that when I do that, I'm starting to say something even if it might leave some of us quite uncomfortable, uh, although I will give you a warning when I get to that section. And just to say, originally there were going to be images tonight, um, but alas, um, because of copyright issues, I've, I've written an entirely different talk, and this one's much worse than <laughs> the one I was originally going to do. The flesh that needs to be loved, the power and beauty of bodies in a time of pandemic. I am sat in my stall at our regular midweek Eucharist. There are half a dozen people in the congregation, people who have been connected with the church where I serve for much of their lives. They are faithful and committed, and each one of them is quite lovely. They are themselves in their quirkiness, and I have come to love them all. However, I'm a little distracted just a week before, I had a bit of a health scare, some potential issues with my heart and blood, which though I'm glad to say came to nothing, have given me pause for thought as I enter my sixth decade. I'm not quite present in my usual way. As I sit in my stall, my colleague, our new curate, shares some reflections on that day's gospel according to Mark. Distracted though I am, as he speaks, I begin to come into focus and attention. His comments center on the dynamic between how we might be caught up in the demands of the world, all its busyness, its business, its need, and the call to retreat and pray and listen. It is a fine reflection, worthy, I think, of a grand setting, a cathedral, say, or a place like this, worthy of a large congregation, worthy of a high mass with smells and bells. And he offers it to us, half a dozen, at a midweek service in a small parish in South Manchester. And as I listen, 
And then we move through the creed and into the prayers and finally to the Eucharist itself. I find I am moved. I am drawn deeper and deeper into something. I am entranced, almost enraptured, if that doesn't sound completely ridiculous. In the midst of the ordinariness, the week-by-week -week conventionality of this service, with all the coughs and the splutters one expects among people gathered in a cold church on a Wednesday in January, with all the shuffles and the old ladies talking to one another as my colleague and I set up the altar, I am entranced by the abundance of it all by how this is God's abundance. This is community. This is participation and the fullness of life. I suspect that we're a stranger to walk in on this service, whether they be a person of faith or not. They would not be struck immediately by abundance. Certainly they might be rather taken aback, even stunned by the glories of the building the way its modernist vision meets medieval ideas of space and wonder, the way the colours seem both to model order and riot. But what, at a human level, might they see? A small group of human beings, mostly in their 70s and above, and a couple of clergy quietly going about the work of priests. I suspect they would not be overwhelmed by any obvious sense that this is a thriving parish. They would see a kind of microcosm of the 21st century church, a handful of old people in woolly hats, struggling along with the aid of wheeled walkers, ministered to by a middle-aged, rather clapped out cleric, and a young hopeful newbie. They would not see glory but retreat. They would see church on the high dependency unit, or to mix metaphors, a glorious building turned care home. They would not see the hub of any great movement or a shiny place. There are no lanyards or scintillating even white smiles here. There is quiet and a bit of a draft. But as the service unfolds, I remain breathless with abundance. Perhaps it is a symptom of my final delusion, a decay in my perception so advanced that I treat desperation as glory, failure as hope. Have I become like those clerical figures in the underworld in Philip Pullman's His Dark Materials books? who claim that perdition actually is glory. These are the dead held in the underworld who insist that this is heaven. If only those trapped there could let the scales fall from their eyes. Or if not quite that, that such purgatory is a necessary step towards transformation. But I don't think I'm trapped in those sorts of delusion. I know what this service is. I know that we are ordinary human beings enacting a 2,000 year old liturgical act in a small parish. We do not have the resources available to ancient foundations. Despite the gifts of my talented colleague and the experience I bring to bear on the proceedings, I know that we do not achieve anything exquisite in our celebration of the holy mysteries. But still, abundance, still loves mysteries, and it takes my breath away. In this body, my body, the bodies gathered, and this body of Christ of which we are part. In them I feel I am being given everything I shall ever need and more. I wrote that meditation back in the middle of February 2020 before everything changed, and we locked up our churches for a season. When I wrote it, COVID-19 and coronavirus seemed very far away still. 
COVID and pandemic were words which gestured towards a rumour, a rumour of dreadful things happening elsewhere in places like Italy, a rumour of something which had emerged in China, what now seems a thousand lifetimes ago, before the deaths of thousands became the norm. That meditation from February 2020 seems to belong to another time, BC, as it were. I stand by it, though. If the coronavirus pandemic represents a particularly pressing encounter with generalised and particular grief and precariousness, and, and what fragility might mean for the reality of hope, I remain convinced it is not sui generis. It is the latest moment in the ongoing grief and fragility of the human story, which in so many ways is a story of bodies, of enfleshments, limitations and flexibilities, of the terror and the glory of being corporeal. And I remain convinced that it is possible for us to encounter abundance in the midst of our countless griefs. It is possible for us to make Eucharist, to make thanksgiving, and I don't think we need to be people of faith to do so. Grief at its broadest, I think, is about bodies encountering the facts of loss and limit and fragility. It is a theme of the world. When one is born, one loses the womb. One is born into a kind of grief. That first cry we make as a baby is a cry of grief as much as a cry of hope. And I'm not sure we ever quite recover from this first encounter with loss, nor should we. Otherwise, we can never quite learn how to live. And call me a fool, a bloody old fool, if you will. But in the midst of all the mess and misery, the sorrow, the loss, and this world of grief, there is another song. That song sings of the abundance of love. In Toni Morrison's extraordinary novel, Beloved, Baby Suggs, a former slave, a preacher, and the grandmother of Beloved preaches hope and promise to her traumatized community, a community still bearing the scars and wounds of slavery, and warns them that yonder, they do not love your flesh, they despise it, so you need to love it, love it hard. Morrison writes, in the silence that followed, baby Suggs holy offered up to them her great big heart. She did not tell them to clean up their lives or to go and sin no more. She did not tell them that they were the blessed of the earth, its inheriting meek or its glory bound pure. She told them that the only grace they could have was the grace they could imagine that if they could not see it, they would not have it. This is flesh I'm talking about here, flesh that needs to be loved, feet that need to rest and to dance, backs that need support, shoulders that need arms, strong arms, I'm telling you. I share these words with you with all due caution. Morrison writes out of and into an African-American experience with all its traces of and lived reality of racism and segregation, its whole history of violence and microaggressions. That is not my context. I bear so many of the traces of privilege, of white privilege in particular, it would be crass and wrong of me to try and colonize these words of baby Suggs. It would 
Also be false not to acknowledge the deep fragility and trauma of baby Suggs's great big heart in the midst of the particular cruelties of experiences I, I cannot even begin to properly comprehend. For in the novel, Baby Suggs, holy herself, who preaches out of the abundance of her scars, retreats ultimately to a quietism in her room, in the light of the tragedy of Beloved. She does not know whether to condemn or condone Sethers' actions. She cannot escape the trace of trauma that slavery has wrought in her life. And still, the flesh that needs to be loved. That line speaks something important to me about living a body, my body, and, and perhaps yours too, I don't know. The importance for me of living a body and not only its precariousness and fragility, but in its messy complexity. For if I know there are good reasons why my body might readily be coded as privileged, there are other reasons why it has repeatedly been judged by those who I think should know better as bad and secondary and laughable and, well, shit. And according to some, dangerous. Somehow this time of pandemic has only brought this messy complexity into brighter, sharper relief. The only grace we can have is the grace that we can imagine. There have been days when I've struggled to imagine it. I want to acknowledge the precariousness as a fact of bodies and a world of limit, and that if the body and the world is to be good and holy at all, living well requires relationship and community and intimacy. I remember that great shift at the outset of the pandemic to the digital, how Zoom and Teams and other platforms connected us. There were everyday miracles amidst the, you're muted, and your camera's off, and, 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 and for all the wonders of technology. And I do give thanks for those wonders. As someone who's a bit clueless and is getting old, and who was shielded and is disabled, and, and that connection really mattered, I can't quite accept those miracles as enough. Life in a time of virus and self-isolation and social distancing revealed the wonderful precariousness of bodies. And, and part of that precariousness is the extent to which we so readily become dazzled by the blur between the real and the hyper-real, the unreal and the surreal. It is through the line of our fragile bodies that mortality, that materiality, that capacity for our bodies to be overwhelmed by disease that I think promise and hope is to be found. Dare I say it, grief, social, personal, cultural is a mark of our capacity for holiness. Grief is a mark of our capacity to grow into the likeness of Christ. Bodies matter. I love that version of the angel Gabriel's words to the Blessed Virgin Mary at the Annunciation as included in the King James Version. It goes like this. That holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. The holy thing born of Mary is precisely the meeting point of dust and air met in the sight of compassion, Rahum, the womb. Holy has implications of intactness, wholeness, inviolability, but thingness has implications of assemblage, of persons, of the pitiable and the material. 
in the ecology of God, the conception of Christ through Mary's self-offering brings together the inviolably pure and whole with that which is pitched into the world as an assemblage of parts, of cells, and limbs, and organs. The holy thing which is Christ is both made and is for all time. It is matter and air. He is body like us in our mutability. And I believe we can be formed into his likeness. I've spent a lot of time recently considering the power of what I would call the proximal and the haptic. The proximal can be understood in anatomical terms as referring to that which draws closest to the center of the body. It has implications of attachment. The proximal is that which is nearest or near to the point of attachment. It can have temporal implications of something which is nigh. And those of you who are involved in spiritual direction circles will know that St. Ignatius has a lot to say about the notion of attachments. They are not merely neutral matters. We can have attachments which get in the way. Attachments to possessions, to intense relationships. However, I sense that not least among the things which this time of virus and isolation has revealed is the beauty, the wonder, the holiness of some kinds of attachment. I want to cry out for the beauty and wonder of bodies. I long for the proximal. And yes, the proximal can be revealed through screens. But can there be anything quite like the proximal known through touch and taste and smell? Oh, to have God on my tongue. Oh, to place my hands in his side. Oh, to anoint his body with perfume. As for the haptic, this relates to our sense of touch derived from hapticos, able to come into contact with. This also has a history in, in, in the word haptine, meaning to fasten. We know that touch has dangerous, precarious, risky connotations. Unwanted touch can be utterly vile. It entails violation. And sticky hands are rarely attractive hands. If we all have unclean hands, how quickly they can become grubby. Yet part of the wonder of touch lies in its its precariousness, its riskiness, its edge. For it is also the place we can negotiate that which helps us to hold fast to the good and the holy and the beautiful and allows the holy and the good and the beautiful to hold fast to us. During that first lockdown, I was shielded as a result of my disability and underlying health conditions. I didn't touch uh, another human being physically for months and it was many, many months before I touched another human's hands or hugged someone received a kiss before I was held. And yes, there are many ways in which we can touch one another emotionally, psychologically, etc. But I felt starved too. I was so hungry. Like many clergy, I had permission to preside at Mass solo, as it were, on behalf of the cure of souls. But I was hungry for more. I was hungry for the feast of thanksgiving, of Eucharist, and for peace. And to be proximal, to be close to the fullness of God's touch shown in the body, the body of others, the body of Christ. Oh, for that table around which we can gather and share a cup and broken bread, passed hand to hand. 
Digital bodies are all very wonderful, spiritual ones too, but dear Lord, is there anything like being fed in the flesh? Which perhaps is just one way of me acknowledging that during that time of isolation, I could barely bring myself to read. There was a particular kind of relationship with paper and word, a struggle to sustain. I think my eyes were so tired after concentrating on faces shown on screens, in Zooms and Teams, that I could not be present to the word on a page. The mirror dimly of the screen exhausted me. A kind of imaginative space, a relationship with word which speaks of and into the world became less available. Is it counterintuitive or, or mad to say that a time of isolation should deprive one of the ability to read? Maybe. Perhaps it makes some sense when one frames that time of isolation as a time also of overexposure to the light of backlit screens, a time of overexposure to faces that were simultaneously there and not there. Reading for me is so often a solitary matter, a habit I acquired as a child growing up in a house with few books, but in which a TV was always on. I would devour any book I could get my hands on. I was that child who turned a torch on beneath the bedclothes when the lights went out so that I could continue to read. But such reading, if it is predicated on aloneness and solitude, is also predicated, I think, on relationship with other bodies and public space and interaction on what is there as much as what is not there, on a kind of human indwelling and a habitus, a way of being in the world where book reading is thematized against a background of physical relationships and public negotiations. During those wild days of lockdown and haptic deprivation, I became saturated not with the proximity of other bodies, but their avatars on screens. I never left home to come home. There was no going out and no coming in. The world out there was in my world. My imagination became peopled with screens. I'm writing some new poems with a view to my next collection. These poems reflect far more intentionally than I ever have previously on themes of transition, identity, and the mystery and beauty of a body in movement, of the ways in which bodies are mutable. I want now to read a few of these poems to try them out on my tongue and my mouth in public for the first time. It's one of the reasons why I'm so nervous, because I'm not sure they've quite landed yet. The collection is provisionally called The Lives and Many Deaths of Eleanor Reichener. Eleanor lived in 14th century London and was by turns a seamstress and a sex worker. She was also known as John Reichener, she has been claimed as a trans woman by a number of medievalists and those in the trans community seeking a history, an archive of their kind, of my kind. There are some who claimed she never existed, others that she's well documented. I think there's something iconically trans about this. And as I've sought to write about being trans and queer in such a time as this, I find myself drawn to Eleanor. I know that in writing her, I fictionalize both her and myself. And that is as it should be, I think, when one attempts to write transgressively. 
But before I read a note, I don't mind saying that I've been disturbed recently by the vehemence and surety of very many people about the nature of bodies, their limitations, their relative fixity. Online forums and social media seem to encourage accusation and the categorical. Subtlety does not speak. It certainly doesn't sell. Communicative capitalism and outrage capitalism generates money from the opinions of those who seemingly are sure of precisely what a human is, who are sure about what constitutes a man or a woman or neither. There is capital in claiming the immutability of identities and bodies. But I want to say this, if there is one thing I am learning in this remarkable embodied life in Christ to which I've been called, uh, that is to take seriously our mutability, whether you like it or not, whether I like it or not, all our bodies are mutable. They are changing. Some bodies are more mutable than others, I suspect. I think there is adventure inscribed in the flesh that needs to be loved and well simply wants to breathe and be and find out who she, he, they might be. The older I become and the more wrecked my body becomes because of my underlying health conditions, in my decay and my fragility, I am finding that part of the power and beauty of bodies is their mutability, their tendency towards shipwreck, the temporary nature of the well and able body, which, if any of us can claim such a body, is surely a temporary matter if we live long enough. I want to speak of the capacity of language to flex and stretch into those lives and bodies which seek after fresh ways of being. I want to speak of the power of language that is spoken and even when repeated can never quite be repeated in the same way. I want to speak of language which when it's written down and therefore seemingly becomes material, corporeal perhaps, may yet be received in countless different ways. So a few poems. This is from a section called Eleanor Among the Saints. I think it's only right to offer a trigger and content warning at this point for sexual content, for references to sex work, and very specifically to eating disorders. I talk in these poems in the imagined inner voice of Eleanor Reichner and her encounter with three famous and much lionized saints. Firstly, with Catherine of Siena, who was reputed to live off the holy sacraments alone and could not stomach whole, uh, everyday food. Content warning, she used sticks and twigs to make herself sick. And this was accounted to her as holiness. The second poem places Eleanor in conversation in her head with St. Catherine of Alexandria, from whom we get the Catherine wheel, the firework. St. Catherine was condemned to death on a spiked wheel for refusing to give up her faith. But rather than kill her, this wheel was exploded by the living God and she was saved, however 50,000 people were reputed to have died that day. And the last poem concerns Saint Perpetua, sentenced to death in the Roman arena. In her martyrdom, she famously becomes shorn of femininity and becomes a man ready to meet God. This poem includes a reference to a dower wunder, this is a saintly or holy blood uh, preserved in a vial 
and it always remains liquid and vital. It's a holy relic showing God's wonders to his people. And the title of each poem is also its first line. I, I do, I'm so worried these are just going to be nonsense, but just feel the mood. Eleanor among the saints. Is it a surprise that those who force sticks down their throats, yes, you cat, you, I see you and know. Is it a surprise that I've learned the meaning of bodies the holy angels, the cherubim and seraphim, burn my lips with coals, salah, salah. Is it such a surprise, cat, that all I know of bodies I know from you? For bodies read flesh, read meat. For meat read beautiful bodies, delicious contradiction. We do not know what they can do or what limit is. Taste Jesus, taste even the nails of his toes. We know not limit except in the test. Let me test you, cat. Let me think of what it must feel like to taste bark, bark on pallet, a stick on tonsils. No one made you do it, cat, did they? I am almost too scared to try. I have tried so many things, most things alien and kind. I'm so scared. Since when did that stop me? I dream of sticks, of ash and oak, birch, elm. Why do I think willow should tickle, not hurt? Underneath my mind there are twigs, the cast-offs of tree, terror. I dream. I have seen fear and hope on men's faces. Let me in, love. You know I care. I really do. Not so different for you, cat. Jesus, take me now. Just before I gag, I dream that the bite, necessary and sufficient, that my lick will make him be gone, the divine, broken departed and when he finds his way out do you even know me cat he shall be a tiny god lost in the underworld i have come to accept that salvation has cruelty inscribed into its honey sweet new day catherine yes queen ain't that a fact Cruelty is one way to say God, ugly God, lovely God. Think Abraham, a ram and near knifed son. How does anyone recover from a God like that? And, and Christ himself, his beating for the ages, Rocky, Iron Man, Indy, Cap, not even they could come back from that. But you, Catherine, you light up sky, born as the wheel explodes, glory be, oohs and ahs the crowd. What did it feel like to be translated into saint? I think of blades. What language can I, a sinner, even speak to be heard by you? I think of blades falling with the only grace they know and the crowd 50,000, a little boy pointing up at sky. Look, mummy, his smile. Perhaps you were already beyond, beyond Catherine as blades fell, took their reward. Perhaps already up there. What language do saints speak? As a child, I cheered when we carried you through the streets. Everyone's pin-up. Yes, queen. I, too, was ready to be knifed for the sake of grace. Magno gaudens gaudio. Rejoice, you company of boys. Come, Catherine. Make of my parts a tribute. 
Once, when I was young, I was shown a dower wonder, love's harvest in a vial, liquid and bright, shred of you, your blood perpetua, word without end, thou lasting miracle. Grant me forgiveness, sister, brother, pet. I get lost in words, their syllables. I forget their moral point. O oh, dower wonder, enough to see your shape written down, naked on parchment. All lovely words become porn. Dower wonder, oh, to trace your trithong, to taste you on tongue. Does that make me the worst kind of sinner, pet? I would smash vile for you, feel you on my hands, priest of the sanguine mysteries. Perpetually, I would travel with you, pet, into arena, witness, lover, friend. I shall witness more than lasting miracle. Loss of breast, loss of vulva, vulva vagina, womb, loss of hips, O oh, reliquy. I shall witness how grace works, a change in light, a change, perpet, pet, petua. For all time, pet, your body refined, liquid and bright. I could be reliquy too, not man nor woman, not in the end. There are things we know before we know them. Eliot claimed that poetry can speak before it is understood. Bodies too. And I've never been sure any of us can claim to understand this flesh, these bodies we are, this corporeality we are so caught up in. As Deleuze said, we do not know what the body can do. Certainly this time of pandemic has made me ever more aware of the power, beauty and strangeness of bodies, of my body, of the bodies of others, of your bodies, of this mystery of which I am part, the body of Christ, which itself seems riven with fears and anxieties about actual human bodies and is increasingly unsure, unsure about how it relates to public bodies and the body politic. In the midst of that anxiety, though, is a song, a song of living and beautiful and holy bodies. This is a song which holds all the stories we shall ever own to, and those which we, through shame or failure, cannot. This is the song which sings all the griefs I and all of us shall ever know. This is the song which does not need to be sung, for it is always being sung in the silence of the universe, in the stirring of birds and the breeze and storm which tickle and shake trees. It is the song of industry and the song of rest. It is the sustaining song of the world. It is the world. It is the world God made and which she beheld as good. It is the universe hallowed and shot through with glory and grace and wounds and scars. It is Christ who holds the world's griefs in his wounds and continues to cry out for a world of wounds at the Father's throne. It is the little story and the great one. It is a line of poetry and an epic. It is a word barely mumbled and the grandest novel. It is silence and the most riven cry. It is the word which dwells and drifts and anchors. It is the song which sings us in all our moments, our births, our deaths, our dreams, our triumphs and failures, in our competence and our defining ineptitude. 
It is the bread and cup which sustains us and exposes our limitations. It is the precarious body that cannot be destroyed. The novelist Anthony Pohl closes his A Dance to the Music of Time sequence with a quote from Robert Burton's extraordinary 17th century text, The Anatomy of Melancholy, a polymathic, sprawling work which analyzes what might now be called clinical depression. The central character of the dance, Nick Jenkins, who has traveled from youth to old age through Pohl's pages, calls the passage I shall share torrential. Burton's words are a reminder that in all times, all things are going on, and much that changes never changes in great substance. I hear new news every day, and those ordinary rumors of war, plagues, fires, inundations, thefts, murders, massacres, meteors, comets, spectrums, prodigies, apparitions of towns taken, cities besieged in France, Germany, Turkey, Persia, Poland, etc., daily musters and preparations and such like, which these tempestuous times afford. Battles fought, so many men slain, monomachies, shipwrecks, piracies, and sea fights, peace, leagues, stratagems, and fresh alarms. A vast confusion of vows, wishes, actions, edicts, petitions, lawsuits, pleas, laws, proclamations, complaints, grievances are daily brought to our ears. New books every day, pamphlets, carantos, stories, whole catalogues of volumes of all sorts, new paradoxes, opinions, schisms, heresies, controversies in philosophy, religion, etc. Now come tidings of weddings, maskings, mummeries, entertainments, jubilees, embassies, tilts and tournaments, trophies, triumphs, revels, sports, plays. Then again, as in a new shifted scene, treasons, cheating tricks, robberies, enormous villainies of all kinds, funerals, burials, deaths of princes, new discoveries, expeditions, now comical, then tragical matters. Today we hear of new lords and officers created, tomorrow of some great men deposed, and then again fresh honours conferred. One is let loose, another imprisoned. One purchaseth, another breaketh. He thrives, his neighbour turns bankrupt. Now plenty, then again dearth and famine. One runs, another hides, wrangles, laughs, weeps. Burton is right, of course. Precariousness and grief and fragility and liability are the markers of human culture and society. We flip and we flop. We fight and we make temporary truces. But I also want to say that those of us who hold fast to grace, to love, to the, fre the flesh that longs to be loved, to the grace that we would dare claim, to God, I want to say that those of us who hold fast to such things, a God whose promise flows through our griefs and fractures and our bodies are no less right. Grace and love and hope and holiness. God is fact and promise. 
And these things, despite our best efforts, cannot be redacted out of the story or simply be got rid of as an embarrassment to one and all. I know many have tried, both those who are religious and those who are not. I know why we do it. Because we cannot bear what love in its fullness is like. So we, you, I, break God's, his, her, their fragile body. But she will not stay still or stay down. She rises again. And to our alarm, and sometimes to our delight, greets us as friends and lovers in the garden of good news and resurrection. And we dare not remain the same. Feel really, this is the really embarrassing bit. Like, thank you, thank you. Can I go now? Can I go and hide? <laughs> um, do I pass it? Can I pass over to someone else? Yes, thank please. you. I think it's wine and the exhibition.